Hey there. There we are. Hi, fella. Can I help you? Don't move. Don't come any nearer. Okay. Okay. Whatever you say. If you take one step across that roof, I'll jump. Yeah. That's what a few of those jerks down there in the street want you to do. Jump. <laughs> Theater 5 presents Jump, Jump. The guy standing there on the edge of the roof, the Hotel Phyllis roof, must have been about ten feet away from me, I guess. Sandy-haired fellow in his late 20s, I figured. Kind of an Ivy League type. Slight. Dressed pretty good. I wouldn't have any trouble if I could get a hold on him, but uh, from the way he looked at my cop's uniform, I could see that I'd have to go very easy. He didn't trust me. He didn't trust anybody. Hey, uh, fella... Did you hear me? Hey, you up there on the edge of the road. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. But not very well. I'd like to talk to you. Go ahead, talk. Well, I don't want to holler. Can I move up a bit, like, uh, up to that vent pipe? Okay? All right. To the pipe, but no further. Hey, that's better. What's your name, mister? What difference does that make? Oh, it's red tape. I gotta make out a report. You know. Well, if it's easier for you, I'm Jonathan Weldon. Weldon, huh? Weldon? Jonathan Weldon? Yeah. Hey, don't I know that name like, uh, you're a writer or something? Or something. Oh, sure, sure, I know. I was reading about your father, Harry, uh, Harry Weldon, in Sports Magazine. He's the guy that has the concessions, like, for uh, hot dogs, programs, stuff at all these stadiums and the ballparks. Yeah. And you're a book writer, huh? Well, I'm pleased to meet you. I'm uh, Charles Emery of the 17th Precinct. You can call me Chuck. Not for long. Oh, you don't want to say a thing like that, Mr. Weldon? That doesn't make sense. Here you are, a young guy. You're pretty healthy, huh? Pack the boat, Chuck. Now, your old man is loaded. You're doing what you want, high-class work. It's not like he was some poor slob who didn't know where his next meal was coming from. (laughs) Pal, you got everything. From your point of view, not from mine. Something's bothering you. Chuck, that is the understatement of the year. Well, uh, what's in here, Johnny? You got girl trouble? Is that it? Uh, look, officer, if I wanted advice, I'd have gone on the couch. The city of New York isn't paying you to give me free analysis or psychological counseling. Well, it could be. But I think you need it. Now, I'm only a cop, but, uh, you give me a fair shake, maybe I can help you clear things up. How about it, huh? Chuck, you're a good cop, but... but it's a long, long way down to that sidewalk, mister. Once you step off, you can't change your mind. So you better be plenty sure you want to take that step. Right? Right. Right, you're right. Give me five minutes. Tell me what's bugging you. Then maybe you'll feel different. Don't. Don't edge up on me like that. <laughs> Don't flatter yourself. I got a wife and three kids, Johnny. I'm not going to wrestle with you on the edge of the roof. But I'll be glad to listen to you. All right. I'll tell you why I'm here. Because I don't want to live anymore. My whole world is just disintegrated. A dame, huh? That wasn't the first thing. It started with my last book, The Gingerbread Motel. Huh? No, no one else ever heard of it either. Came out two months ago. The greatest reviews you ever saw. Well, what's wrong with that? Critics called it the season's greatest literary achievement. Sensitive, lyric, evocative. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, sure. 
So this morning I went to see my publisher, David J. Bernstein. Johnny, look at these reviews. L.A., Dallas, Cleveland, Chicago. Every one of them rates. <laughs> That's quite a collection. Yeah, Dave, I know. I, I've seen most of them, so... Well, I don't understand why you don't advertise more. Well, advertising costs money, Johnny. Yeah, but with these reviews... Well, the critics like Gingerbread Motel, Johnny, but we're not getting a response to the award advertising. Yeah, but it's not a good book. You know, you have to tell the public. It doesn't happen that way, Johnny. When a book sells, we advertise. When it doesn't, we can't afford to. Gingerbread Motel isn't selling. We'll be lucky if we get back your advance. Well, guess I've been counting chickens. See, with those reviews, Dave, I thought I had a bestseller, maybe even a movie sale. Forget it. Now, let's face it, Johnny, you're a great writer, but you're not a crowd pleaser. And if you could only learn to cater to the crowds, maybe you wouldn't be such a good writer, but you'd make a very good living. That's the way this happy day started. Well, okay, Johnny, but just because you're not making a million bucks, well, lots of guys don't. They don't kill themselves. You probably make more than me, and I got a family. I know, but I need more. Just how much more I didn't know until I met my girl for lunch. I see, Johnny. At least I think I do. Oh, so, Sylvia, that's the way. That's the way it seems to stand. And you're sure that Bernstein was right? Oh, Dave always tells me the hard facts. And they evidently are all hard. Oh, Sylvia. I know it's a disappointment. Disappointment? Johnny, I don't measure our engagement in years, but in books and broken promises. There have been three of each. Oh, darling, please. Let's not argue. Oh, no argument. But time is passing. Fast. Sylvia, I know it's not the way we planned, but we can get married today if you want. And live on what? Your rave reviews? Johnny, I'm not ready for a Greenwich Village railroad flash. Gee, I thought you were glad I was a writer. Why, well, I am, Johnny. Well, these are just things that can happen to a writer. To you, Johnny. But not to me. I admit I like expensive things, living nicely. You have talent, Johnny, but it won't pay my bills. I see. But there is something you can do. You have a father. Make your peace with him. Work in his business and write on the side. Oh, I doubt if Dad will That's do your it. only chance, Johnny. I'm going to be practical this time for both of us. She handed me back my ring, Chuck. Gave me till the next day to get squared away with my father. Otherwise, we were through. Uh, dames. Well, Johnny, dames, like they say, are like trolley cars. You just wait for another. Not like Sylvia. Beautiful. Beautiful, Chuck. I'm sensitive and the only woman I ever wanted to marry. That, well, that's why I swallowed my pride and went to my father's office. Yeah, that's the deal, Barney. I either get the merchandise at my price or you lose the contract. Call me tomorrow. Yeah. How's that for the old fist, Johnny, huh? The quarter sent off each hot dog. You know how much that means to me? Thousand. <laughs> well, Johnny, you're uh, quite a stranger. What can your old man do for you? Well, you uh, once promised me a job, and I need it now. Yeah, how come? Everybody tells me what a great success you are. Oh, I am. Gingerbread Motel got great reviews all over the country. Oh, come off it, Johnny. There's only one kind of success, the kind you can put in a bank. I told you that when you got out of college. Now, I still got a great business here, and it's yours if you'll knock yourself out working for it. That means seven days a week and some nights, the way I did when I built it up. You got a lot to learn, crowd handling, commissary, accounting, buying. I, I just want a job. I, You see, I don't want to spend my life haggling over the price of frankfurters. I mean, I figured if I had a job, I could write evenings and weekends. Forget it. 
I could hire plenty of clock watchers, Johnny. I want to take charge. Dad, Dad, you don't understand. I want to get married, but I can't give up writing. Then write something that sells, boy. You know, I tell you the truth, Johnny. They tell me I should be proud of you. I'd like to. I try reading your books, but I never finish one. They bore me stupid. They got no guts, no excitement. Just like me, Johnny, you got to cater to the crowd or they'll starve you dead. I need help, Dad. I... Can I put it to you more plainly? Yeah, Johnny. Sure you need help. So you can't make terms, especially with me. Nobody, but nobody dictates to Harry Weldon. Chuck, I walked around. I, I couldn't see any way out. That's why I came up here. I, I want to die. Still? What's the point of living? I have nothing. You got one thing, Johnny. Time. Give me one hour. One lousy hour. Hey, what's that? That's your public, Johnny. Yelling for your blood. There's quite a mob down there. Oh, don't pay any attention, Johnny. Give me an hour. Please. One hour. No more. <laughs> I got Jonathan Weldon to give me his word not to jump off the roof of the Hotel Phyllis for one hour. I felt I'd won half the jackpot. I figured that all I had to do would be to get two other people to the Hotel Phyllis roof to talk to him. His father, Harry Weldon, and his girl, Sylvia Preston. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Weldon. Come on, this way. Your son's over here. This is a lousy thing for him to have done. I'd like to get my hands on Excuse me, Mr. Weldon, but if you're going to talk like that to Johnny, you might as well shove him off the roof personally. Now, you talk to him easy, like. And don't try to get too close. Thank you, officer. I'll try my best. Johnny? Johnny, your father's here. Oh? Stay there. Stay, Stay right there. Johnny... What do you want? I want to die. Oh, don't say that, son. I don't get it. Three hours ago, I asked you for a favor, and you practically told me to drop dead. I can't believe you care. Oh, of course I do, Johnny. I... Johnny, he's your father. Oh, maybe, but first he's Harry Weldon. Tough Harry Weldon, who can chisel a quarter of a cent off the wholesale price of hot dogs and force anybody, including his son, to do what he wants. Oh, maybe I was a little rough on you, Johnny, but that's only because I thought you ought to face up to the facts of life. I... If I hurt your feelings, I'm sorry. Uh, first, you kicked me in the teeth. And I said I was sorry. I... Look, if your mother was soft and kind of sensitive. I, I guess it ain't your fault that you took after her, not after me. But I loved her, Johnny. And aside from my own personal feelings, it's all wrong to throw away the life that she gave you. Now, look, there are hundreds of people downstairs in 45th Street, and you're making nothing but a fool of yourself up here. Some photographers took my picture when the police pulled me through the crowd, and we're going to be spread all over the newspapers tomorrow. Now, right now, you make up your mind and tell me what you want. I don't want anything from you. Ridiculous. Johnny, you got me over a barrel. You can make any kind of a deal you want for yourself. Deal? Yeah, I'll give you $1,000 to walk away from that edge. For $5,000. 10000 Johnny. 25,000. Johnny, have a heart. All right, all right. 50,000. Think what it would mean to you. You could work in your books, get married if you want, or play around if you want. You wouldn't have to get up every morning and the rest of us slobs during a day's pay. All right, Johnny, 100,000 and a certified check. The officer here can act as a witness. <laughs> I don't come across, you can sue me. <laughs> That's your closing bid. Johnny, that's quite a hunk of dough. I mean, it won't break me, but I'll miss it. 
Whatever. If you want more... All my life you tried to buy your way, and now you think you can buy my life. My life has never been for sale, and it's not for sale now. Uh, Johnny, Johnny, your father's only trying to... Get out of here. Get him out of here, Chuck. I led Harry Weldon away, knowing that I had struck out. A couple of minutes later, Sylvia Breton arrived. I took one look at her and knew that she was a great reason for any guy to water. Officer, I'm Sylvia Breton. Where's Johnny? Over near the edge of the uh, roof there. Oh, poor Johnny. Officer, is it my fault? I mean, I I didn't think he was so attached to me. Now, look, miss, it's a lot of things all rolled up together, but uh, maybe you can help him if you want to. Of course I want to. You just take it easy when you talk to him. Yes. Try to get him away from the edge of the roof. You got me? I'll I'll try. Hello, Johnny. Johnny, aren't you going to look at me? That's better. Do you know why I came here, Johnny? Yes. Because the police brought you. Oh, Johnny, that's not nice. No, I suppose not. I came to tell you I was sorry about this afternoon. You know I love you. We wouldn't have been so close for five years. At lunch today, I I was just trying to be practical. I could be a millstone around your neck, Johnny. I'm not a thrifty housewife type. But if you think we ought to get married, Johnny, regardless of your financial condition, I'm quite willing. Willing? But not anxious? Oh, please, Johnny. If you love me, don't do this awful thing. I'd always feel guilty. My my conscience would bother me till the day I died. It would be just too terrible. Oh, please. Come here. Kiss me and put the ring back on my finger. Uh Uh-huh. That would be a little too easy, Sylvia. Then you don't love me. Not as much as I used to, perhaps, but... Enough to say goodbye. Johnny! Don't you see what that means, Sylvia? I'm giving you what you want most... I'm giving you a clear conscience. You're free. You're absolved of guilt. You can mourn me or not. Whatever makes the best impression on your friends, you've done your duty. I think you better go. Johnny, please. Please, don't. Hey, Johnny. I don't get it. Turning down a hundred grand and a beautiful girl like that? Johnny. Johnny, what do you want out of life anyways? You won't gain a thing by ending it all. Yeah, you may wind up way ahead of the game. Okay, come on, Johnny. I'll buy you a drink. In the morning, you'll feel better. <laughs> I bet I would. Maybe well enough to start a new book. Oh, sure. Someday you'll hit your own jackpot in your own way. Huh? How do I How do I get out from here? Here, I'll give you a hand. Yeah, no. Oh, but Johnny, didn't listen, you say... Listen to them. Oh, uh, who cares what I, they I say? I can't come down, Chuck. They want me. They want me to jump the crowd. You hear what they say? Johnny, and... take my hand. Come on, I couldn't take my hand. Them, Chuck. I never cared about them before, and now I can't break away. Now, don't try to grab me. I'll take my hand, Johnny. Huh? I'm in their hands, Chuck. When I came out here, I put myself in their hands and their care. Get away from me, Chuck. Get away from me. And don't fight me, Chuck. Johnny, let go. Oh, 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 oh. He asked for your help down there. You down there in the streets. And you wanted his blood. Well, you got it. Blood. On your head. On your head. Presented Jump, Jump, written by Raphael David Blau, directed by Ted Bell. 
In the cast, Jack Manning, Ralph Bell, Gene Gillespie, Ian Martin, and Sam Raskin. Audio engineers, Marty Folia and Bill Sandreuter. Sound technicians, Ed Blaney and M.C. Brock. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, Box 233, New York, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. <laughs>